So I, I think you, you could see my screen right now. Yes. Yeah, we're good to go, I think. Yeah, Hassan, feel free to go ahead. All right, so hello everyone and thank you for uh, having us today. My name is Hassan Mansi. I'm the program director. I'm a program director at Flat Six Labs, and I'll be uh, gladly your co-host today. Uh, today is a very special day because we have um, yeah, guests from uh, from the United Kingdom and, of course, our uh, co-host here in, from Egypt. Uh, so uh, I definitely would like to thank our partners, uh, the British Council, who has been giving tremendous support through the Developing Inclusive and uh, Creative Economies uh, program in Egypt. And of course, uh, a special thank you to our UK partner, Hatch Ideas, and the CEO, Yemisi, for all the support and for connecting us with our outstanding speaker today. Uh, all of this uh, you know, um, session and, 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 and this workshop wouldn't have been possible without your support. Uh, for those who don't know, Hatch, um, Hatch Ideas is, is our UK partner uh, and they've been doing a great job supporting entrepreneurs and pioneers and innovators realize their creative and social and cultural challenges through projects, businesses and initiatives by providing them with bespoke high quality state of the art consultancy, training and concept development and project management support. Um, I would like to welcome today to uh, our um, main guest, um, Noel Stewart, who is a milliner at the Noel Stewart Millinery, who would be sharing uh, a great story and a great um, experience of uh, how actually he made it to the top, how he is now uh, leading in the, with the top fashion agencies all around the world. And um, our co-host today, my colleague, proudly, Mar Marie-Therese Pham, who is a managing partner in Flat Six Labs, and I'm proudly working with her. So without further ado, over to you, Marie, and uh, looking forward to this great session. Thank you very much, Hassan. Um, thank you for having me and uh, moderate this amazing panel. Uh, I would like to welcome our guests and, of course, our guest speaker, uh, Noel Stewart. Uh, Noel, it's such a privilege to have you with us today. Uh, especially as part of such a program focused on creativity. Uh, I, I really salute the British Council and Hatch for, for endorsing this. It's one of the areas where we don't see uh, a lot of support uh, versus other traditional industries and, 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 and areas of, uh, of, uh, of the world. So um, very happy to have you with us today, Noel, uh, and uh, super excited. Um, I'm personally super excited, as I'm sure uh, all of our attendees to know more about your journey and um, your, your path to success. Uh, so I want to start with um, a very simple question. Um, how and when did you develop the passion for fashion? <laughs> um, to be honest, it wasn't, it wasn't an instant thing. It was kind of a sort of gradual realization. I was training. Um, I was at art school. I was learning to make furniture, actually. Okay. Um, and do various different types of decorative painting and I would sort of started making things that went on the body and I just was you know when you're a student you're sort of uh, investigating loads of different things and I came across um, various different milliners um, and it just sort of seemed to make sense and I didn't really realize that fashion was an industry um, although I luckily found out that my grandmother made her living making wedding dresses during the war um, so sort of in the genes, I think, a bit. Um, but then I sort of looked at what fashion is and how it functions. And at that time, like we're talking sort of mid to late 90s, you know, the fashion, the runways were the sort of were on fire. We had McQueen, we had Galliano, we had Marc Jacobs coming up and all kinds of different things um, in uh, London and Paris and New York. And I just thought that I like that. That looks good. I like the creativity of it. Um, and also the sort of, the, you could do things on the runway that you can't really do anywhere else. Um, I mean, initially I thought I wanted to be an architect. I thought um, I wanted to be like a painter and decorator, um, but it sort of became apparent that like three dimensional in terms of my own personal creativity was the way forward. Um, and then I just got hooked. I start, I worked, I did a work experience um for another milliner who also was very young like he hadn't been making hats for very long 
Um, <laughs> and I was like, this makes a lot of sense. There was this sort of constant turnover, like every six months, well, now it's quicker than that, but every six months there was a whole new range of shows and you'd be like, all this new creativity come out. And I was like, yeah, I like that, that makes sense. And I quite like new challenges. And as it's turned out, like my business is sort of endless projects after project after project, which I really like. Um, right. so everything's different every day is different yeah so you're initially fashion fascinated by all those runways and, and fashion <laughs> weeks that we all are fascinated with today <laughs> that's amazing so 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 you started working you did this job with this other milliner who was you're saying he was it was a young guy and then how, how did it go from there how, like when did you start designing when did you start your own thing tell us more about this yeah so actually i mean i had been making hats but not selling them or not really it was just for sort of uh, in my degree and my education and i so i would work for them and they taught me about the fashion system the cycle mm -hmm. uh the seasonal cycle um but then they actually stopped making hats because there was no money in it and mid 90s there weren't many hats out there so i left there and I went to work for another milliner, the uh, very great Stephen Jones, who makes hats for Dior and Comme de Garçon and um, Azadina Liar and various people. Um, but I also realized I didn't want to work for him. So I went back to college and I went to the Royal College of Art um, here in London, which is the only MA in millinery in the world. Um, wow. So that was and I worked while doing that as well. So I stayed working for him um and then did the course as well and it just gave me a really good understanding on how to design how to create a collection how to sort of really harmonize my my language and what i really cared about um and then when i left there i launched uh, my own label and started selling to barney's in new york well and across america um and harrods and selfridges and various other things like that as well as doing collaborative work for runways so yeah, I was pretty, I mean, I went back to college specifically to yeah. develop those skills because I didn't have it. But yeah. my BA, it was like, make a chest of drawers, make a lampshade. You know, it wasn't about like fashion, that context and the context really critical. And also it gave me networking, really great networking. A lot of my friends from, are still from those periods. I still work with Erdem, who I met at the Royal College. Um, mm. So yeah, it, it, it gives you a context, that kind of thing. Amazing. So, so you you mix passion with education because this is very important. Some some of people on the creative side think they can just get along with uh, in life with their creativity, but I think like having education as well is a very powerful tool. So, I really like that you did that. And this is a great example. So, let me ask you this: There is it's one thing to be creative, and you 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 sort of discovered a passion for this industry, mm -hmm. and you you worked on it. But then starting a business is something else, right? It has its own set of challenges. You can be an amazing uh, hat maker or milliner, but not necessarily uh, you don't have the the um, the, um, the you don't know the ins and outs of running a business. Mm -hmm. So how 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 was that for you? How did you manage that? Did you make mistakes at the beginning? <laughs> I still make mistakes. I still make a lot of mistakes. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm not the most natural businessman. But the reality is when you're sort of, I, I mean, I'm operating in a super, super niche environment, yeah. you know, and so although the gains are not huge in t fi financially, mm -hmm. the parameters are quite narrow. So mm -hmm. I can function within that. I mean, I look at some one like Erdem, who is an incredibly talented designer, um, but he's also a very good businessman. I mean, he puts me to shame. I mean, I'm quite lucky I've got him as a friend, so I can ask him questions. <laughs> and stuff. Um, but, you know, like you find your own, for me, like the thing that keeps me going is my passion and, and my ability to work it out and ask people for the right kind of help. Because the reality is I'm not super numerate, like I'm not great with you know, figures and finance and all of these kind of things. I'm also not great at asking for help, but I've managed to, um, and it sort of works. And I think the thing that sort of kept me going is the passion to want to do it um, and developing my skill and being out there and working with great people. Because at the end of the day, it's a lot about people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like what you said, asking for help and, and that it wasn't an easy thing for you, but you had to do it. So because this is something very critical for someone who's starting their business is to 
confront themselves with their areas of strength and areas of weakness and get support on those areas of, of weakness. Um, my next question to you is about funding. So you, you mentioned that you operate in a very niche market, right? Definitely. So who invested with you? Was it your own personal money? What, what, were you able to land investors? No, I had okay. no, I had no investment. I think like I, I worked, I worked really hard. I had three jobs for quite a lot of the time. I had a teaching job that yeah. kept me going. And in truth, like the reality is because it's so project led that I can fit other things around the business. Um, I mean, up until pre COVID, I was working full time on the business. Um, now I've had to take a little bit of teaching work to sort of supplement this until it gets back up to speed. Also, we're going this through this thing called Brexit, you may have heard about it, um, <laughs> which has meant that we're having to adjust to a different situation with Paris, which is not great. Um, so uh, my business has gone through, but you know, this is what it's always like. You're always having to constantly adapt uh, and make it work. And for them, in the main part, it does. Um, I, I mean, I say I haven't had any investment. The British Fashion Council supported me for a few seasons with a trade stand and a runway show for one of them. So that, but you know, like in terms of a cash injection into my business, mm. no, I haven't had that. But then my margins are so tiny and the output, I keep, I've got a very cheap studio. Mm. Um, I've kept my overheads as low as I possibly can. Yeah. Um, and I don't have any full-time staff currently, thank okay. God, because if I'd have had full-time staff going into COVID, I don't know what I would have done. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So you did it all on your own. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Amazing. And, you know, just being able to work, with, I've been working with other people. I've been very lucky that I've always worked, whether it's teaching, uh, teaching millinery, I teach hats, yeah. um, or working for other milliners. I've worked for quite a few other milliners, which is a great thing because I learn, but I also get paid. Mm, yes. <laughs> so, so tell us about that day you you got your first contract with the first big department store to sell your hats. How how did you get to that day? How long did it take you from let's say when you went back to school to study about hat designing and all that to that day? So when I graduated, I think maybe even before I graduated, a uh, cust a woman who loves hats. Uh, came and visited me at college and commissioned me to make a hat for her. Okay. Um, and I'd made hats for individuals before, but she was quite demanding um, and knew exactly what she wanted. And we worked it through together. It was quite a collaboration. But she was like, no, if you ever want any support, um, I'd be happy to help you. She makes jewelry as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I had my first collection, I showed my first collection in her front room, in her sitting room. Okay. So, you know, I mean, it's a very nice sitting room. Don't get me wrong. It's like right in the center of London. Yeah. Um, but she also was supplying to Barney's. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the, the Barney's used to have, before mm -hmm. Barney's went bust, um, she... Uh, they'd have like a roving editor person that would go around and just scout things and she yeah. came and they bought and they bought for me it was I mean I can't even remember what the quantities were like I think it was quite small to start off with mm. but if to me it was like I'd made one hat here two hats mm. there you know like I wasn't used to making like 50 60 hats mm. and it was terrifying and I learned a huge amount that first season but I was very lucky uh, that they were very understanding and tolerant and they walked me through the process of exporting which is not easy particularly to America um, and were very supportive and they nurtured me over a few seasons and I mean I will forever be grateful to the woman that took me on Julie Gilhart and Judy Collinson two women actually because they really supported me and I learned so much and I think it's really tough now particularly you know because I operate in a very small sector of fashion but i'm expected to communicate and operate on the same level as fendi and balenciaga the reality yeah. is i don't have that budget i don't have those customers but i need to look like i'm on that same level yes um and that's really tough and it's very hard to do particularly when you get started and i think a lot of designers i mean i speak about this a lot with my friends a lot of designers young designers freak out because you have to suddenly be at this high end level doing two seasons a year 
producing vast quantities of clothes and shipping them around the world and being able to do all of that seamlessly. And if you mm -hmm. don't, you get penalized, you get fined like Harrods. If you don't, if you get one thing written wrong on your price list or whatever, they fine you. I don't know whether they're quite that bad, but they were when I was applying to them. It was a nightmare, terrifying. Yeah. You know, I was young. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but you work it out. Yeah. At the end of the day. Yeah, that's how it goes. Mm -hmm. So, so back to this point of you suddenly having to meet that standard of very high end fashion brands. How, mm -hmm. how, how did you manage to maintain this level? So, how did you? keep up with, you know, fashion is a very fast moving industry. Mm -hmm. How did you keep up with the different trends? How did you know how, which, which department stores or which yeah. brands to work with or, or which brands to attract? How did you know to uh, your, your product market fit, if we can call it that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, that was the, always the easy bit because, okay. um, because I knew what I liked. Okay. And I was out there, you know, like this is pre Instagram, right? So I would buy magazines and I'd be looking on television, I suppose. But it was mainly about magazines and books um, and looking on the runways. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I think it's a lot easier to find what you like. And yeah. I think we're irrespective of whether you're doing fashion or furniture or painting or whatever it is you're doing, you know what you like. You have a sort of innate sense of it. And also I think it's like, I knew which stores I wanted to be in. Like I actually hadn't heard of Barney's before I went into Barney's, which is kind of crazy because I hadn't really sort of thought about it. But then pretty quickly afterwards, I knew that I wanted to be in H. Lorenzo, which is a great store in LA. And I ended mm. up being in there, thankfully. But I think you now with, with our phones, you can, everything's sort of fed to you. If you go out there and you start following the things that make sense to you um, and, I think it's also being about slightly realistic, like I was never going to be producing tens of thousands of pieces to sell in every single, um, you know, department store in America. That just wasn't realistic for me. And it's also kind of not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's knowing your path your, or your trajectory and being realistic about it, I think is the is a real key. And actually, as it turned out, I wasn't I now don't wholesale anymore. Because I work for other people who do wholesale, I got fed up of having to do all of those logistics and packaging and making all the swing tags and all of this stuff and also the sales that goes with it. So now I work much more on a collaborative basis. So we're just, do, we're just doing a project with Mulberry where we're manufacturing and we supported them through the design and we make the stuff, but I don't have to deal with any of the marketing of it or all of this stuff you know like or sales and so I didn't I mean I've done that for many years but I I didn't love it so I don't have to now and I work on that and films and whatever else yeah that's very smart so finding the the thing that you like to do and doing it perfectly well and then the other things just ship it off to someone else who does it well right well in an ideal world but I think in particularly in my industry and in my kind of business I have to do everything I'm yeah. the PR I'm the marketing I'm the shipping department I'm the tax person I'm the yeah. HR I do it all literally there is no one else um yeah. I mean I had my dad helped me with my accounts for a while when he retired but we almost we got crossed with each other so now I have a friend who does it okay. um you know like it, it, it's I make it work um but as you grow you find the right people I think yeah so no you, you your your hats sell all over the world so do you think fashion is something that reflects or should reflect a particular culture does it change when it it moves across jurisdictions um did this did you did you experience that or you just made hacks that you liked and that matched those high-end brands you wanted to work with did you ever think that if i'm gonna start selling brands outside of the uk they're gonna have to be different hats or yeah totally i mean because when i was sort of coming up it was um america mm. you want to go to america it's the biggest market and actually like i did refine my work to <laughs> To, to be tailored a bit more towards that because actually Americans are very conservative mm. um, and they don't, you know, like in here in the UK, we have the royal family and there's flowers and there's feathers and all this kind of stuff, which isn't yeah. really my bag anyway, um, but in America, so it's much more clean and classic and chic and you think of Jackie Onassis and that kind of thing. Um, so I did tailor a part of my collection for that. And then also when I was selling in Asia, um, we would do because they had much more hunger for 
fun and creativity and less about practicality, there would always be a section of the collection that was like a sparkly headband with like some sort of animal on it, for example. I mean, I'm simplifying enormously, but you know what I mean? Like you, when building a collection, you, we did have to think internationally because the reality is we don't live in just, I don't live just in the UK, I live in the world. Yes. Um, and then I, so to go back to the beginning, the early part of your question, I think I or, uh, recognize my domestic market very yeah. it's very important um yeah. but it, it i'm not just only that uh, yeah. we're all part of a global community and i think it's about find uh, own where you are first yeah. and i yeah. i think i did that um yeah. and then how you sort of project outside of that is very much how you, what's important to you so like the Japanese customer or the Chinese customer wanted a bit of British innovation and sophistication, for example, for want of a better word, or sort of some sort of quirkiness that was quite fun, but they still wanted it to feel quite British. Yeah. And the same with the American customer, actually. They still, they wanted a classic hat, but they wanted it to feel like it had a British sensibility on it somehow. So, you know, it's a subtle things, but actually to the customer, they're quite important. Mm. Um, and it's a difference between a sale and not a sale. And I think authenticity is absolutely key. And I yeah. think a customer can smell in authenticity immediately. Well, at my, at my category level, I think, mm -hmm. you know, like every category level is different and depending on your sort of discipline as well. Yeah, I think what you're saying is really, really important. I think it's super important for any starting business to really establish themselves in their home market, especially if it's such a big market. I mean, I understand if it's a tiny market, but if it's such a big market, then you might as well really establish yourself in your home market, uh, get all your learnings, you, you, the, 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 the wrongs and the rights, and then uh, ex export this to, to another market. I think uh, that makes a lot of sense. So... Um, yeah, so um, uh, I wanted I want now to to slightly move the discussion to how we can um, take from your experience and uh, uh, see how we can bring it closer to our audience. So our audience are all startups in the creative space in Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Egypt is is such a, a big country, a uh, hundred plus million people. <laughs> is the official figure and um, we do have a lot of uh, creative young youth uh, we also have a very long history seven thousand plus years yeah um, <laughs> so a lot of the the the, the creatives tend to um, extract a lot from that history into their designs what do you think of that given that this is something very specific to to our part of the world how how do you see that and how do you see this being exported to the rest of the world um, I think it's one of the, it's very personal, particularly if you're a creative, like how you channel your own culture and your own history. Um, and I think that's a really important part of it. it. It feels very personal, but at the same time, I think it's about creating, for me, it's all, my personal experience is like, I've channeled my personal history, uh, but also I've tried to make it relevant to now. Yeah. Yeah. and relevant to the customer um, mm. and try and find that thing within me that I think that my customer will resonate with and yeah. identify with and there's things that it's I mean I don't I don't claim to have got this right by any uh, sense of the word but I think if you look at the really successful designers or the really successful creative entrepreneurs they've done that thing that speaks beyond um, <laughs> speaks of their personal experience, but also speaks above the personal and becomes something about where we are in humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and for in my context, it's mainly about women. And I think of someone like Azadine Alaya, a North African, um, who came to Paris and very much channeled his own personal experience, but also spoke way beyond his personal experience and spoke to every single woman that and had this sort of extraordinary power to create fantastic clothes. And I think, he, although he wasn't necessarily a mega billionaire or anything, he's revered the world over by by anyone who makes clothes or is interested in fashion because he did it his own way and he made it it was extremely successful um his own way and he did speak about his own culture and he did resonate about his own culture 
but he spoke beyond that as well. It's really hard, mm. you know? Like, I don't think anyone, it's, anyone has a fantastic, easy formula for that. Yeah. Um, but I think there's something specific about Egypt is that there isn't a person on this planet that doesn't have a fascination and reverence for Egypt and its culture and where it's set up the entire world, you know? Yeah. So I think you're already in with an in, you know? Like it's a lot more interesting and exciting than the vast majority of cultures out there. Um, but it's how do you make it relevant? How do yes. you make it exciting to <clears throat> a customer in New York? Yes. A customer in Beijing? Yeah. <clears throat> and also unique and personal at the same time to you as a creative something yeah. that people are going to really want unfortunately i think uh, more than so now more than ever it's about creating desire yeah. um and a personal connection the phones are fantastic but you have to sort of jump out the screen mm. to get people in because we, uh, particularly during covid like we haven't been able to go into stores and buy furniture or buy clothes it's coming yeah. back but you know it's like how do you get people how do you speak to people beyond just the personal how okay. do you go beyond it transcend yeah <laughs> so this was actually going to be my next question about um uh moving outside your home market but i actually want to ask you first in your opinion how do you th how how receptive is the uk market to foreign brands <laughs> It depends on which which sector you're talking about. Like, I mean, I can only speak about fashion and maybe art, I suppose. Okay. Those are the sort of areas that I'd be familiar with. Um, but I don't. I think now is without a doubt the best possible time that there has ever been in terms of receptivity to people uh, outside of our domestic. I think maybe even more uh, receptive to people outside of the domestic market the domestic pool of creatives um which is a great thing but the reality is it's wildly competitive yeah whether you're talking domestically globally whatever you're fighting for i mean the sort of the customer base at the high end the people that are going to spend the real money in theory if that's what you're interested in and that's what i'm kind of talking about it's not a huge amount of people and they it's getting into that is really tough but people are open if it's authentic, genuine, heartfelt, mm -hmm. real, personal, brilliant, okay. unseen before, new, not sort of necessarily, you know, like it's a new take on something. Yeah. People recognize that. And I think there's a real hunger for that. I mean, unfortunately, the West, it, for, unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know which way to look at it, but it, there's a real hunger for newness, excitement, something special, different that you haven't seen before that comes from a fantastic source. So it's the opportunities there, it's just getting the opportunity. Yeah. And do you think if having the product properly priced is an important thing? So I learned, uh, uh, Judy Gilhart at Barney's taught me like uh, a very important lesson. So, I mean, initially I was just selling in their store on Central Park West or I can't remember, Fifth Avenue or whichever store it was in New York. And first season, she's like, you're very expensive, Noel. I don't know whether we can do this for much longer. And I was like, okay, God, I've got to be cheaper. And then the <laughs> next season I went back and I said, I've tried to get the prices down, you know, desperately trying to sort of make myself a bit cheaper. Like, oh no, don't worry. It's fine. We put you in the higher price category. Um, and I've learned as the years go by for the customer that is interested in my area of fashion, they don't, they may say they want something with a discount, but the reality is it's quite a lot of the time about spending the money. Um, and the money isn't really an issue. If you've got, if you, you know, it's the same customer that goes into Harrods and it's like, oh, I like this show, I'll buy it in every color. They don't think about it. It's not a problem. Yeah. Um, but having said that, they also do not want to have the piss taken out of them. Yeah. I don't know whether that translates very well, but you don't, you know, you don't want to feel like you're being taken advantage of. Yes. Um, so yes, price is always a key, but I think it's, as long as it's honest and you're not yeah. being ridiculous, I think it's fine. But what did you do when she told you you were expensive? How did you manage to, to drop your costs? Were you just slimming your margins or you, you dropped your overheads or? 
Well, like, no, I God, I couldn't do that. I mean, I think at that stage I was in my mother's spare bedroom. That was my studio, so I did, there was no overheads to be dropped. Um, but no, I think I was just a bit more. I was like, okay, fine. Like I, I think once I'd realised that they wanted it to be in this sort of higher bracket, mm -hmm. and that the customer was fine with that, and also recognised that it was imported. Uh, and was okay with that I was it's not like I took the I didn't take advantage at all but I think okay I'm going to get the expensive fabric and that customer wants that expensive fabric and wants me to take the time in doing it and I would stop being cheap because and I think once you sort of identified where you're sitting and what you care about which customer you care about it's a lot easier I mean, I always struggle because I have to sort of switch between the different areas for different customers. So mm -hmm. someone like Mulberry, they want something a little bit lower priced, whereas yeah. something like Givenchy, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter what it costs <laughs> okay. at all. If they're just not interested. Yes, we'll just get five of those hat boxes made. It doesn't matter. Whereas yeah. other customers are like, we need to have them come in under this price. You know, it's a different yeah. thing. And I think it's, a. am now, because I'm so much more business to business, mm -hmm. um, I have that conversation quite early on as okay. to what's important yeah. to you and to my customer. Okay, so my next question is about striking a balance. So we, we touched upon that. How, how can a creative person strike the balance between following his own uh, passion and his own and being genuine in his designs and work and, and, and balancing that with the commercial market needs? Because sometimes they, those two worlds, they like clash. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think it's really tough. And I think it's something that everyone struggles with, regardless of where they're at. I think only once you get to even, you know, if you get to the sort of be the creative director of a massive house, it's still a concern. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get a runway wrong and everyone's like, all that was like wildly creative, but I don't want to wear any of it. It's yeah. a fail, you know. Um, I don't think there's there's no sort of golden answer to that but mm. I think it is just about being mindful all the time and you know if it's if you're trying to be a sort of higher price point a sort of luxury brand and everything's like accessible and boring okay. you, it's a mismatch you know and I think um yeah it's a I think being realistic and looking at the context and seeing who you're competing with Mm. And if you're spend, making a dress for sort of £20,000, you're up against Dior, yeah. which has sort of, con, you know, a whole history and the reality of that behind it. And unless you can create that or something mm. towards that, mm. then it's going to be tough. So you, yeah. Yeah, I think that being realistic with yourself and what you actually want to do. Because sure, you can go out there and create a grand maison if you can yeah. convince enough people to invest in your business yeah. and you can get enough fabulous people to wear it. But yeah. also I think listening, something that's really important, was has been really important to me um, is finding people you trust their opinion, mm. getting their feedback and making sure it's honest. Yeah. Um, putting it out there as much as you possibly can because you get that feedback as well um because i think it's really hard as a creative to you have your instinct and you have what you your taste and your personal perspective which is one thing but i think getting feedback and whether you listen to it or not is a different matter yeah. but it also helps you to own your own feelings you know it's like oh does this hat look good in this blue and pink and everyone's like no blue and pink's hideous and like i don't care blue and pink's amazing and i believe in it or actually you're right blue and pink is disgusting you know and it really it's those kind of things are really key and integral to sort of how um you focus your mind and then also it's not just about creative things to go back to your question it's about like i wouldn't spend the money on that I how much is that going to cost i'm not going to spend ten, five grand on that yeah like, you know it, or i would spend the money on that but maybe you just need to add another ribbon or something you okay. know yeah those kind of things are really key and i think it's sort of contextualizing and finding a network of people that you trust and respect i mean i think that would be the true of any creative Okay. Or any entrepreneur, actually. Actually, having said that, don't quote me. I'm just sure there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are a lot more single-minded than I am. <laughs> no, no, it's absolutely correct. So, um, Noel, have you watched the movie The Devil Wears Prada? Of course. 
Of course. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, our audience has watched it. So you remember when, when they wanted to let Miranda go from runway, from running runway, she oh, said, yeah. I have a list of designers and, and people who would follow me wherever I go. Hmm. Did you have that in, in your career? And do you, how important do you think those kinds of collaborations and partnerships are in, 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 in one's career? Uh, so it, do you mean, do I have like a list of people that would follow me? Or do you mean that I... I'm on someone's list. No, I mean, <laughs> not for, forget the list. I mean, having those sorts of business collaborations, having those sorts of networks and connections and people that you you, you give business to and, and people you will continue to give business to wherever they are. In general, like you mentioned, for example, the, the collaboration with Mulberry, this is, mm -hmm. these are things that I think add a lot to, 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 yeah. to the business. So what's I mean, thing? for me, it, it's all about people. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I'm very lucky that I've had collaborators that have come back to me season after season. But then, you know, people change. I was worked with Claire Waite Keller at Shivanshi for three seasons and then she left. Okay. Um, so now I don't worship with Shivanshi anymore. I don't know where okay. she'll go, you know, and that's kind of normal. But I think about uh, your network and building authentic and trusted um, connections with people is absolutely key. And I think I, part of the reason I think I got that job is because I had a great introduction by a, via a stylist, but I think also Claire and I resonated, like we could work together. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I, I think I am nothing if not, a, I have two things, I have my skill and I have my network yeah. um, and my experience, you know, yeah. which is maybe it's a similar to skill. And I think, um, yeah, the collaborations for me, are, but it's kind of the essence of what my job is, you know, like, yes, I make hats, but it's also about collaborating. Mulberry come to me because they know that I can realize their vision and that I'm pleasant to work with and that I can try and make it work as best as possible. And I think a lot of other designers would say the same thing, but you know, like I do have so many variety of different things. It changes from week to week. Yeah, that's true. So you, you, we were talking earlier about Instagram and, and social media in general. You, you, you're seeing how it's taking over our lives, and particularly in, in the fashion world. A, a lot of the, the, the young designers are, um, and are going to influencers to uh, market their products. What mm -hmm. do you think of that? And how important do you think social media is nowadays in promoting fashion and, and in giving, um, a, like giving a kickstart to a new brand? I mean, it's not something I've ever done. So, I mean, take every, what I'm about to say with a pinch of salt, but I would go back to what I said before. It's got to be authentic. It's got to make sense. Um, and I think you, I see a lot of the most successful sort of social media campaigns to mm -hmm. me are the ones that feel real and connected and uh, yeah. authentic. I think if you just see someone who's pretty promoting something that's pretty and there's, you know, like, uh, it depending on the category. Mm. And like, and I'm, I can only talk from my experience. Like I look at something, uh, first of all, I don't know whether you've seen, but there's this Balenciaga Fortnite collaboration that's come out. I was like, what? Like there's Balenciaga, this revered French house has done yeah. a collaboration with a computer game. That's completely yeah. insane. But uh, actually, aesthetically, it makes a huge, uh, they also done something with Crocs. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, it sort of fries the brain initially, yeah. but actually it's bloody clever. And actually yeah. they will sell millions and millions of products through that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, again, the customer, that customer specifically is looking for something unique, different, mm -hmm. something you can't get anywhere else, something that's very unusual and bizarre and brilliant, and but also gettable and that they relate to. I don't relate to Crocs or Ashbest or Fortnite, but I get, I relate to Balenciaga, but I, and I can, don't think I'll be buying them, but you never know. Um, but they've been so successful in um, turning Balenciaga around, like in terms of how they've grown that brand. I mean, I'm wearing it now. I would never have bought Balenciaga before. Um, but he's turned it from like a five million pound company to a five billion pound company or something or 20 billion. I don't know what he's done. Um, and it's mainly been through social media, so it can work. But yeah. I just think it's got to make sense and you've got to be savvy and it's got to make. Yeah, you've got to do it with the right people. And 
make the most out of what you've got you know this is always about utilizing making the most out of the opportunities presented to you mm, amazing um we were having we have some questions coming through i think we've covered uh, most of the questions i asked today by the way were questions we received from from the uh, people who registered to attend today and we have some more questions here i think we've answered a good chunk of them i want to know how getting special experience in fashion design marketing so uh, how and when did you scale up? We spoke about that. Your opinion about angel investors. So uh, Noel did it all on his own, but. <laughs> well, sorry. actually, sorry. I've remembered now there was someone that invested in me and they invested for two seasons and they were a private individual. So I think that that would consider be angel considered investor. an angel investor. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, basically, I mean, I suppose I can say this is such a long time ago, but they were basically like they wanted to get rid of money from a tax point of view mm -hmm. um and they wanted to be involved in a small creative business and yes. they wanted hats so they i gave them seven hats and they paid for a runway show and a party afterwards nice. and i did the made the hats and promoted it and i think they maybe gave me money for materials and that happened over two seasons mm -hmm. um and that wasn't uncommon at the time and we're talking like early noughties yeah and it was great from my point of view, you know, like I got promotion and actually it put me into a different context with the designers. They yeah. saw me as a lot more of a harder hitter because I'd sort of suddenly done something like that. Yeah. Working with a private individual can be a double edged sword, you know, yeah. I think in hindsight, I would, I was quite lucky I got out on skates, but another friend of mine who was also working with the same person, they got in some very tricky water um mm -hmm. i think having everything written down making sure there's some really even if it's not like a lawyer have it in an email because that's depending on your um location i don't know how different laws work in different countries but here if you write an email and you sort of had an agreement of some description it counts mm -hmm. legally not as much if you've written it down legally but just making sure everyone's on the same page and has the same understanding and who owns what who has intellectual property right that's a big yes. sticking point for a lot of people um so it, yeah just cover your bases yeah and make sure you like the person yes no, that's very important this is actually really it's like a marriage right when two people yeah. are getting married they need to 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 like each other <laughs> they have yeah. to be on the same page they have to say to share the same vision and everything has to be laid out in detail intellectual Honestly. property rights, uh, who needs to do what, where, when, uh, rights and obligations on each party, it's really, really important. And also in, in the case of maybe st startups, uh, they need to be aware of the return profile, that if they invest with you at an early stage, it might be a bit of time until they are able to recover the returns. So this is very important for the angel investors to be aware of, especially if they're new to, the, to this uh, type of investing. Um, how important is your social media presence, Noel? Do you have, ha have you had any help with this? Any advice? Have I had any help? I don't think I've had help apart from like just friends and seeing what other brands are doing. Yeah. That I like. Um, but actually it's been very key to me. I mean, I don't have millions of followers at all. Mm. Um, I, I only really use Instagram now because it's sort of the one that makes the most sense for what I do. Yeah. Um, but it's been really important. Mm. Uh, the job I did uh, made this hat for Celine Dion to wear to the Met Gala in 2018, 19. Mm -hmm. I can't remember which. Um, and that came through Instagram. Yeah. The creative director of Oscar de la Renta saw it and was like, actually, no, he didn't see the hat. He saw something I did for, um, yeah, that one. He saw yeah, something yeah. I did for um, uh, Valentino and then uh, uh, contacted me. So, you know, yeah, it's the only, it's like an online portfolio for me, but I think yeah. it's about finding the way that works best for you, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. Um, tell us how you hand, I'm translating an Arabic question. How, tell us how you handled all the challenges so that you, uh, up until you got to that amazing state. So I think you pretty much answered that. A lot of hard work, guys, a lot of hard work. <laughs> Right. And it doesn't uh, stop. And actually, I have this conversation with other designers who are doing well, you know, it's not that the challenges, uh, some of the challenges go away, but the, there's more challenges, there's always more challenges, and you have to be okay with that. And also yeah. having to adapt to the challenges, and love what you do enough that you're prepared to push through, find the solutions and make it work. 
because it's not like the challenge has just become different and bigger. Like Erdem, for example, it's like, yeah, he can design a collection. He knows how to do that. He can pick up the phone call to pick up the phone to the editor of Vogue, but he's still also now managing 75 people and all the payroll for all of that. And also the pensions and all of that stuff, which everyone thinks, you know, being a fashion designer is extremely glamorous and exciting. Yeah, there's an element of that, but it's also exhausting and you're running a business. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you mentioned that most of your 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 work is B2B, not B2C. So no. all those amazing celebrities we're seeing here, you dealt with them through a, a store or through a brand? Uh, pretty I wanted to ask you who's your favorite celebrity you worked with, but then... <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? Who was your favorite celebrity that you worked with? If you worked, if you worked directly with them, I mean, Celine was pretty incredible. I have to say, I mean, if for no, sorry, Celine was amazing because the whole experience was extraordinary, and it's a very unique platform that the Met Gala. Yes. Um, it's unlike anything else. Yes. Um, but there isn't actually a picture of her here because the actually in the film it, it didn't come out super great. But I worked with Michelle Pfeiffer, who I've worshipped for years, like since I was a teenage boy, because she was Catwoman in Batman. Yes. And we made a lot of hats for Murder on the Orange Express for her. And one of them we made for her, she loved it so much. She got one made for herself and she got one made for each of her hair and makeup team. Um, and that was really amazing because she was for me because I don't think she's incredible and I love her career but also she was so lovely and sweet and would greet me and I'd never worked on a film before and then suddenly I'm working with Michelle Pfeiffer and Daisy Ridley and Olivia Coleman and it was just mind-blowing it was really great um so for me that was like a really important moment and trained me for dealing with Celine who was a different kettle of fish altogether okay interesting we have a question. What basically sets your hats apart from others? And, and yeah. I mean, I think for me, uh, something that I always try to bring to my work is that it feels right now. Mm. It feels contemporary. Um, mm. And I like, I'm not sort of one for fuss and too much frills and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think it, ne it needs to feel very much placed in the now and have a sense of modernity. Mm. Um, I'm always trying to strike that balance between it feeling contemporary but also relatable so that it's not so avant-garde you've never seen anything like it before and it freaks you out but at the same time like there's a bit of that um I mean I slightly suffer from being that designer that wants to create something that doesn't scream mm. you know so like this the idea of having a, shirt, a hat with my name all over it is like a no-no but you know it, it just doesn't interest me to promote myself in that way um, I'd rather the, the customer felt uh, comfortable and had a quiet glamour or a quiet sort of sophistication. So that's my particular take. But it doesn't, you know, like sometimes I have to do a wild bonnet covered in pink flowers, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's not always that straightforward. <laughs> so um, we have a question here. Um, one of the audience says I'm working in um, games and doll designing um basically when does the designer take the decision to move to becoming like to to the business side and starts actually mass producing to some extent and does this impact your 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 passion and your genuinity as a designer so they work in dolls like games yeah um i'm not sure yeah i mean i worked for as a creative director for a company for a while uh, for a very old, like 270 year old hat company. They make hats for the Royal household and all kinds of things, but very traditional hats in theory. Um, and I think it was, for me, it was a massive learning curve because I was working with a fact, they were basically, a they were producing tens of thousands of hats a week um, mm. here in the UK, but handmade. And it was, they had this amazing heritage, but they had no respect for it. Um, and I found that my passion for it evolved like it changed into, I became very passionate about lifting them up mm. and about finding their uniqueness and finding their um, special things that I could pull out and project out um, and making, presenting them to the world in a sort of different way that was exciting. I don't know whether I'm really answering the question, um, but it was always a struggle in terms of, yes, so the point of the question is, I was always having to battle with the managing director. The managing director was like, no, we'll just use these crap felts, these not so good lower quality felts. So I was like, you cannot use these lower quality materials. 
yes. because it undermines <laughs> the authenticity of the brand, which we're trying to build up. Yeah. You know, and I think it was always a conversation, but that's mm. always a conversation within a, another company. I think mm. um, you have to have your line where you were. I mean, I threatened to walk out if they use those low quality belts because I yeah. felt it would be so damaging. Mm. But I think, again, it comes back to knowing yourself and knowing what's really important and what matters to you and what you're prepared to put up with. Yeah. Where you're prepared to compromise and where you're not. Okay. So I um, think we've answered when should I think about turning my business model to a B2C model. Now I'm selling my products B2B. Um, I mean, I, because it's so easy to, well, it depends on the product, but mm. I think if you think it's easy to, you can do it quite easily. I mean, with social media, it can be in theory quite easy mm. to sell B2C. You just have to be aware that it takes a lot of work to do the marketing to get it out there. Yeah, the marketing and then there are the, the logistics. Now everything is being done online. So you have to manage the payment, the online payments, the all delivery partners and all that. So if you feel you're capable of doing those things and it's worthwhile, mm -hmm. then I, you could do it tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but I just think it's one of those things. It also gets some great di direct customer feedback. Yeah. Which is great in terms of going, you know, like, oh, it doesn't feel quite good in my head, or I'd love it if it was like a different shade of black or whatever. Mm. Um, those kind of things are quite invaluable because then they can feed back into your B2C, uh, your B2B. Um, I mean, I feel quite lucky that I've worked in all these different aspects and they all sort of feed into each other in one way, shape or form. And mm -hmm. I think if you feel that you've got the bandwidth to be able to do B2C, um, and it's not going to take away from the rest of the business, then go for it because you'll learn stuff that you wouldn't any other way, I think. But don't let it compromise the main business. Do you think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger, I can't say the word now on the webinar, but it's a bigger problem if you, if you mess up an order for a customer, for a, for a direct customer or for a company or a, for a B2B. Because, you know, customers can be very harsh. I mean, corporates can be harsh too, but uh, I don't know which, which one. I mean, I think it's, I mean, they're both pretty bad. You don't want to mess up anything. <laughs> um, but at <laughs> least with a, um, a customer, like a, a company, like if I'm say, you know, I'm shipping sort of 60 hats to New York and they, you know, there's something small with the paperwork. I can get around that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I might have to pay some money or I might have to redo the paperwork. If mm. you mess up someone's hat for their wedding day. Yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> like, okay, it's, I'm not gonna get fined. I'm not gonna, but it's like, I wanna do a good job. Do it also, yeah. I don't wanna ruin someone's day or for them to feel uncomfortable. That to me is just, a, whereas the person on the other, you know, the on, on the other end of the line in New York or wherever, they're, they're just doing their job, they clock off. Yeah, you know, yeah that's not, what I thought too, but. <laughs> but it's also, it's a different thing because if I become unreliable to that customer, it affects in New York, mm -hmm. it affects how much they, you know, like, oh, he was a nightmare to deal with last season. He screwed up his paperwork. Maybe I won't get the order next year, which will keep me alive. Whereas that woman, she's not going to go and recommend me to all her friends anymore, which is a, um, annoying. Yeah. Just don't but, screw anything up as much as you possibly can. And if you do, just be really polite and honest. Yeah, yeah. It makes life a lot easier. Don't pretend you haven't done it. That's the worst. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and then maybe final remarks. So how do you start a premium brand or how to put it in the minds of the client that this product is one of the premium, is a, is a premium product? <clears throat> Get other people that people respect to talk about you. Mm. I mean, this is the sort of essence of like um, uh, this sort of influence of it. Make sure that they're the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, get it under the right people's noses. Because at the end of the day, I can shout forever about how amazing I am. But if you don't know who I am, you don't care, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if Beyonce talks about me or Beyonce puts me on her head. Amazing. <laughs> you know, and it, it's also don't necessarily go for the obvious one either. I think, go, <clears throat> think, always think about doing something different that no one else has done. Like Beyonce, everyone, it's, for example, is the one that everyone wants to have a hat on. But mm. actually, you know, who's the new Beyonce? Mm. Who's, the, who's styling the new Beyonce? Mm. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know who it'd be like a Doja Cat or someone, you know, like how do you find those people? I think it's about being connected and finding the right people that would be uh, receptive to you and will get what you do and are prepared to enter into some sort of collaboration and not necessarily about finance, but about passion led because we're creatives. Um, it's not about I'll pay you to wear my hat. It's like, do you like this? I'll send you one for free if I can afford to do it. Yeah. Which I've awesome. done. Yeah. And it hasn't always worked out, believe me. But sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I think um, it's almost seven. So I wanted to, um, uh, to thank you, Noel, and maybe just uh, a final piece of advice from you to all the uh, young creative entrepreneurs uh, listening to us today. <laughs> Good luck, everyone. It's, you're going to be brilliant. Just love it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noel. It was Thank really, you. really uh, a lovely conversation. I'm sure everyone in the audience really enjoyed it. Thanks for being here and sharing your experience and, uh, and your journey with us. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope everyone has got something out of it, even if it's just seeing my pink face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they did. Over to you, Hassan. Thank you. It has been a pleasure, Noel, having you today. And uh, I'm sure that all the audience uh, have benefited from your great experience. And um, it, I mean, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, we'll be playing a video at the end of the session about the DICE program. And okay. looking forward to having you one more time, uh, maybe in different programs. Uh, yeah. And uh, we'd love to see you in person in Egypt. I hope so, one day. It's on my list. I'm really looking forward to coming to Egypt. Actually, I would seize this opportunity to extend an official invitation for you to our Plat 6 Labs the 10th anniversary uh, mega event that we're doing and we're very proud of. Uh, it's an event that will be taking place in one of the most historic places in, uh, in, in, in Cairo, in Manuel Palace. And uh, we'll be bringing in regional partners and investors and, uh, you know, uh, teams from the six to seven countries that we're operating in, and definitely would love to be having you there. Uh, and of course, uh, Yemisi Mokulu, you're, you're, you're our uh, guest of honor as well. Amazing. Yeah, let's go to Egypt. <laughs> let's, let's see the firm as well for, uh, I mean, in person for real. <laughs> That'd be so good. Of course. So uh, thank you one more time and uh, Karim Marwan, over to you to play the video and uh, thank you for all the audience for uh, watching us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Let me play the video for one minute, please. Share screen, now we're ready. Thank you, Hassan. Hassan, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Karim. And uh, this concludes the session for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Waiting for you, Noel, in Egypt. Yes, I can't wait. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.